Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to sit this piece of gum right there. All right. Okay. So, um, like Emily said, I'm Lauren. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, y'all. Um, my sobriety date is September 22nd, 2007, and Psychic Change is my home group. Um, when uh, Robin asked me to speak, I was like, yes. She's like, you're going to be recorded? I was like, okay. And uh, <laughs> so I'm like, so here we are. And... Um, I, for the most part, what I'm going to tell y'all tonight is, um, you know, what happened, what it was like, and what it's like now, and um, it's also my experience, strength, and hope. Um, It's basically, for me, it's um, what worked for me, because that's all I can speak about is uh, what I've experienced. So, um, all right. I'm from Mobile, Alabama. I... um, (laughs) You know, I'm from L.A., (laughs) and um, I'm the only child, and my mom is, uh, she introduced me to this uh, program when I was eight. However, I did not come in at eight years old. I came in for the first time when I was 19, Um, and I, um, you know, people always talk about how they felt different or, you know, that kind of stuff. I really didn't know what I, I don't think for a long time I ever knew what I was feeling. So I could never really identify it as being different or anything. Um, I just know that I felt grown up ever since I was a little girl. You know, like my mind was a lot bigger than my body. And um, and I, uh, I think sometimes that worked for me, though, because it was a way for me to cope and it was a way for me to... Um, handle situations that maybe a a child would uh, not normally um, know what to do in. And um, I do know that, I guess for me, um, I always share that a lot of my memories now, today, I can see from my childhood that were great memories. But for a long time, everything I thought about um, that was stuck in my mind were usually traumatic experiences. I don't know if anybody else can relate to that, but that was a lot of the stuff that would repeat over and over in my head, and it was those broken tapes, you know, just the the records continually playing and uh, skipping, twisting up, you know, and uh, for me, when I talk to people now and it's like somebody experienced the same situation, my interpretation of it was a little misconstrued. And uh, I don't even know if that's a word, but it works for me. Uh, It was a little messed up, you know. Um, And and that's kind of how I operated for a long time, is just seeing things um, that was usually based on low self-esteem, fear, um, and... And and basically, that's just how it was. It was usually just a lot of fear and feeling... um, just kind of alone in the in most situations, um, especially when you're – my mom, like I said, is an um, alcoholic by the grace of God today. She's in recovery. Um, and But when you're an only child and you uh, don't have, like, somebody else to, you know, run things off of, uh, bounce it off, you know, you kind of feel crazy. And, um, and you get, you know, um, that's kind of the way that I thought everybody felt. Um, So I left Alabama when I was seven years old and moved to Pensacola, Florida. And um, that's also around the time my mom was trying to get, um, you know, out of uh, Mississippi. We were in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. Um, It smelled really weird there because there was like a mill going down. But I remember like little memories um, of – just craziness, you know, like finding pistols and like, you know, ended up in just random places. And and I thought, like, I know now when I look at like little kids, I'm like, oh, I was that age, but I don't feel like I was that age, you know. And um, 
But I know that it all helps in the long run. Some of those situations, I don't know what they're going to bring up later in the past, but I know I'll be like, okay, God, I see why I needed to go through certain things. But um, we were kind of like on the run uh, from Mississippi into Pensacola, but it was kind of exciting. I didn't know why I felt like that was exciting, Um, but I liked it. It kind of was like a movie and an adventure, and that's kind of how my drinking got started too. Um, But... So we moved to Pensacola from Mississippi, and we were in a uh, shelter, and I remember I got chicken pox in the shelter, and I, nobody wanted me around, you know, like, it's contagious, and I didn't really understand about that. I just kind of thought that, you know, they didn't they didn't like me or something, and um, so I, um, those are kind of like different, like give you an idea of what I meant by like I felt, you know, alone kind of thing. This thing's real hot. Mm-hmm. Okay, there we go. <laughs> oh, it was like right in my face. So anyhow, okay, back to uh, the story. So, <laughs> so um, I would go to my uh, grandparents during the summertime, and um, they lived out in the woods in uh, a little town called Harold, Florida. It was on Deer Lake little lake pond it was super fun you know and uh so I'd go there on the summer times you know we were living in a shelter on the other part of my life and it was also that like what role of my life am I in at the moment this is only at seven so you know what I'm saying like it got a little crazy as I got a little bit older but um my mom came into the rooms at eight years old and when she was trying to get sober that's when I started drinking and um because I was camping um on the summer times in the woods and you know it was really easy to get alcohol there was you know that was just the thing to do and I remember um drinking in the clay pits and um running from the law they'd come up and again it was like the adventure you know the excitement and um and it went on like that for a while and um and and I never had consequences and I also, during that time, is when I saw what, if you weren't working, like, a program, you know, or if you're kind of what they talk about, being a dry drunk or whatever, like, and when you're trying to get sober, the emotions that are coming out, well, I was on the other end of that, so, because when my mom was getting sober, so... um I now know what it, you know, what I was feeling when I was trying to get sober, but I see what she was feeling with, and I was kind of just, mm, I guess the verbal abuse and stuff like that. That's kind of when that started coming in to play, and um, and I, she was told to write down things to journal, and so when I was eight years old is when I started journaling because she's like, well, go journal, and I, my all my journal entries were like going crazy on her you know because I didn't have anybody else to talk to about it and I definitely wasn't going to open my mouth because I'd get in trouble so um that's also how I found like just take it to pen and paper don't talk about it and I also didn't really talk about feelings and that's where I believe when I talk about I don't know what I was feeling most of the time um things started shutting down and I started drinking at that same time, too. And and I remember smoking cigarettes in the clubhouse when Mom was, like, in meetings. I'd be on the, the you know, the whatever those awning things are. And I was, like, collecting cigarettes that people had already smoked. And that was exciting because you could crash down into the bottom of the parking lot if the thing. You know, I didn't think about that. But it was, like, sneaking out. And uh, she's in a meeting. And I'd hear him say the Lord's Prayer. And I'm like, oh, that thing, you know. And, um... And like a year and a half ago, I was able to go back to that clubhouse, and that was pretty interesting. Um, so that's kind of like the beginning of how my stuff started was drinking. And um, But I also always, like it talks about in the big book, lived like those double lives. You know, um, I always share this, and maybe somebody can relate. I don't know why I always share it, but. In fourth grade, I got real pissed off because um, one of my best friends got most attractive and I got class clown. And that was, like, kind of how things happened. Um, I would joke a lot. I would, um, you know, make a lot of um, just just off the chain, like, uh, comments and stuff like that. And people always thought it was funny, so it worked for me. And I held on to that for a long time. I still hold on to that. I'm not, I'm, I like to make people laugh. But um, so 
I progressively kept drinking for a, a while, and um, we're in AA, so I'll stick to that. But I also, you know, had uh, the other um, things involved in my story. And um, But I always managed to kind of be around people, you know what I mean? People like to be around me because uh, they probably usually didn't know what I was going to do or say or, you know. So uh, I kept it entertaining, kind of like how my drinking and, and using was, was always like a, a party and it was fun. And um, But when I turned 16, I got into UCF, and that's how I ended up here in Orlando. And my senior year of high school is when I kind of just uh, took off. Um, not like run away, but just took off in like my um, alcoholism. Um, I started really feeling like the blackouts and um, the the lying, the manipulating. I was always into manipulating because my, you know, parents were divorced and if I didn't get it from one place, I was going to get it from somewhere. That wasn't ever a question. It was just how. And again, that was kind of exciting to, you know, to run the situation how I wanted to. And, um, but I came here to Orlando um, and I was just I was ready to not have any pressures from anybody else. It was, you know, I was the only person in my family that had gotten a scholarship. I was the only person in my family to ever go to a university. Um, and I'm not just talking my mom, my dad, and my grandparents. I'm talking my family, like my uncles and everybody. It was you work in a an industry job and that's what you do or you, you know, do something else. But no one ever went to a university. And, um so I kind of felt like I needed to do this for the family. However, I also wanted to just know what it was like to not have to answer to anyone. And I went eight hours away. And during the first week of my um, college, I uh, locked my charger in my room. I lost the key to the dorm room. I They had no way of getting in touch with me. And I had rushed a sorority at UCF. And the cops were already at the sorority house right when I, you know, rushed, and they were looking for me because my mom and dad were freaking out. You know, they always had ties on me, and I was um, I was their, you know, little girl. And, uh, however, I was like, I ain't a little girl. You know, I've been feeling like a grown-up forever. And when I was 16, my mom relapsed. You know, I'm going to bounce around, so that's how my mind works. But, um, so... <laughs> So when I was 16, my mom relapsed, and that's also right when I was going into my senior year. So that's when I kind of was just like, well, if she's going down, I'm going down, and here we go. And uh, another adventure. And so um, so I went to college, and uh, my mom ended up visiting me one time, and it was always those weird roles. Like, I didn't know if I was the daughter, if I was the mother, if I was the friend. If And I sometimes still have to do that with people. I don't know what role I play. I'm just starting to just be like, I'm Lauren. You know, that's a pretty, I like this role. I'll rock it. But um, so I, you know, when my mom came and visited, um, we got into some crazy uh, situation. And um, she ac actually uh, somehow from what happened with us, she was able to get sober again. And I didn't. I was not wanting to get sober. If anything, it was like my retaliation against everything I was on. Again, just, um, I, you know, I kind of started hiding out. You know, the phone was the devil. I hated answering it. I hated checking my voicemails. It was very rarely were you able to leave a voicemail because it was always full. And, um... I, that fear, again, was starting to creep up so bad because um, my anxiety uh, at this point, I was about 19 or around here, and um, I really had so much anxiety. I would have to do anything, like drink anything I could get my hands on. I would keep those little mini bottles of wine, you know, the four packs, you can get them at the gas station. And I'd get them when they were warm, too. It didn't matter. And I'd keep them in the back of my seat in my car. And I remember, and this might be a reason why I don't eat meat anymore, but I remember when those little baby bottles of wine were warm, they tasted like rotten chicken. But I would drink them down, and, ugh, it was horrible. I remember being underneath I-4, getting ready to go to work, and I would chug those little baby bottles of wine, and like, what the hell? This is just nasty, but I needed it. 
I, I really needed it because I had to serve tables. And, you you know, I, I did it better when I was drinking. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes I would sneak, you know, the people's drinks. Especially I'd say they rang it up wrong and I'd real quick, like, look around, make sure nobody's watching. And then I'd pour it in a styrofoam cup and then I'd run it to the back where the server stations were, and I'd be like, yeah, I got that one there. And then I'd go back later and drink it, and, like, that was like that, oh, I don't know if I'm going to get caught, but it doesn't matter because usually no consequences did, you know. Um, and that I ended up, dro- like, failing out of school because I didn't go to school. And um, I remember it was a big deal because one time I slept through Halloween, and then I was like, oh, this is getting serious because if it was a party or something, I could always show up. Halloween was usually always a party, and I realized I'm not even showing up for the parties. Like, I'm not even, like, what is my life? You know, that was, that was my mentality at that point. That's the big picture that I could see. And, uh, and so I eventually um, just really started, I spent so much time for like a year and a half in the bathroom. I would just hang out in the restrooms. We had a really nice, it was a really beautiful bathroom, but... Um, I would, I really, and I was content with it. I'd do my makeup, I'd, I'd, because this is when the alcoholism was really getting funky, and I was just like crazy in my head, like, and I'd, I remember I'd do my makeup, and I'd hang out in the bathroom, and I'd wash my face, and I'd do it over, and hours would go by, and we'd supposed to be out somewhere, and I'd, they'd be like, well, that girl, you know, and I, that was how things, I would say I was going to show up to places, and I would never be able to show up. And that's how I really started to let uh, down some of the closest people, my girlfriends in college. And um, my mom, still at this point, had just gotten sober, and she was in Pensacola, Florida, and I'm down in Orlando. And some of my girlfriends, um, they couldn't handle me saying, I'm, I really, you know, I'd get crunked up, I'd be at the bar, and I'd tell them everything they wanted to hear and really, truly apologize from, like, the depths of my soul, I thought. And I was like, you know, I'll come and I'll meet y'all at family weekend or, you know, I won't, because I'd get really good in with the, all my girlfriends' families. And, you know, I never had, I was able to make friends and stuff, but I, it still sometimes frightens me. I was never able to follow through with the relationships. I would, like, promise everything and put on that face, and I would be, like, that best friend, but then I could never follow through. It was like that person, you know, and uh, I still have to work through that today, you know. Um, like, am I going to be able to follow it through to the end? You know, but what's the end? You know, I can only live, like, am I able to be that friend today, you know. Um, so that was something that truly um, started to get out of control is that the people that meant a lot to me noticed that I was really going through some things and uh, – and it was it was alcoholism. It was this disease of alcoholism that no matter how much I really wanted it, um, it had gotten to the point where I had no school to go to. I had really no commitments to go to. I had a job that I had to be at work at usually like 6.30 to, you know, start the shift. I worked at the improv, the comedy club. So I'd wake up at like 4.00. But there were several occasions where I'd sleep through and then have to call because I couldn't even wake up to make it to a 6.30 evening shift. And uh, and there was times where I would be in a blackout and forget to close my shift, you know. All of my tables, I'd come back the next day, it would be like, and I'd be like, ooh, I'm so glad I had that corner section because I don't know if y'all were ever at the Improv Comedy Club. You know, some places you couldn't see. So usually I'd have, like, a corner section so the manager never saw that I didn't even wipe down nothing. I mean, it was getting crazy. I don't even know how I – anyhow. But um, that's kind of where I was at. And and that was when I was 19, and I finally reached out to my mom, and I was like, I need some help. Um, I was like uh, – and I would – and and they would come to the rescue, dun, 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 dun. like another adventure for the family. Because just because we're getting sober doesn't mean our family is always completely there and healthy. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, it was that once again that time to save Lauren. Lauren needs help. Let's save her. And that's and that went on for about two years. And I'd go and I'd pick up a white chip or I'd get a tag, you know, a key tag or 
whatever was on the agenda for that that time to save me. And um, I'm b- very grateful. I joke about it kind of, but that was just the repetition. Um, and after a week or so, friends would start calling, and I'd be ready. It wasn't so bad, you know. The anxiety had lifted a little bit. And um, But eventually, um, I turned 21 years old, and a m- month after my 21st birthday, I got my DUI. Um, I had planned on picking up a rental car. Um, which the reason why I needed to pick up the rental car from a party is because the night before at that party I was responsible and didn't want to drive the rental car home drinking and driving. But you see, the next day was a new day, and I had been drinking that whole day, so I had some friends come and pick me up to get the rental car, and I heard the music in the car radio. And I don't know about y'all, but when I started hearing the beat to the music, it was my trigger that I had to go to the club. Well, I didn't really want to go, but now I hear the music. Let's go to the club. And that is all I needed. And I had a blackout. And we had picked up the rental car first. And so that rental car and I went into a a house that night. I crashed my my car, which wasn't my car, um, into a home. And um, I don't know how it happened, but I do remember the family coming out of the house with a video camera, and I was just a mess. I was, I don't even know, if I ever caught that, got that videotape from those people, I promise that would just be a hoot to watch today. (laughs) But I, I just was like, how in the heck did this happen? I was planning on getting my car and going home, but the damn music, you know, like it was the music's fault that I ended up blacking out and in a home. Okay, so... That's just an idea of what was happening to me, and this was in 05. So um, that was pretty crazy because the thing is, most people when they go to jail are not excited about it. However, I was freezing. I was really excited to get a jumpsuit, and then they tell me I get a cozy little cot bed, and I was like, thank you, God. You see, for once, I didn't have to deal with that insanity I was locked away like it was like free at last but in a different way you know like I was free from myself for a moment to chill out and take a break it was like the ultimate checkout now a normal person would not feel that way (laughs) but that's really how I felt and they're like don't you want to call someone I'm like "Uh, no Mm -mm. I'm good (laughs) I was scared. I was so afraid to call anyone. That, and you know you don't remember, like, your friend's phone numbers. All I remembered was, like, my grannies or somebody. I'm like, oh, my God. And I, oh, I was so scared. But eventually I did call. Actually, no, I didn't. That's a lie. I didn't call. My, my best friend Heidi found me in jail because, you know, you call the number. And that's how they found me. So, um, but I do remember walking out of the parking lot of the jail and, and calling my dad, and uh, and that was like, you know, uh, just all this, no, 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 this is going to happen, this is going to happen, but no consequence, no follow through. So, um, however, you have to go. Not everybody has to go to treatment for their DUI, but I thought that when I filled out that little paperwork. Um, I could maybe say a little bit of the truth, but when I got in front of the woman, she'd look at me and think I really wasn't a sick person and didn't need to go to treatment. That's what I believed, and that was a lie. She sent me right on into uh, intensive outpatient treatment, and that was my first day at intensive outpatient treatment was 666. It was June 6, 2006, and I absolutely went in there bold face just like ever smiling and telling her everything was good and when they told me they were going to piss test me I about died on the floor because I everything was you know positive and I blew um over the legal limit and this was like a just a normal day just a normal night this was 1 p.m in the afternoon and she's like you are blowing over the legal limit right now and you drove here to intensive outpatient and I'm like, absolutely, this is my life. So I went through outpatient treatment. It's supposed to be like a three-month program. I think I tried to drag it on for like six months because I'd get sick or something would happen, you know, constantly make up excuses. And um, 
And then they asked me to stop coming after I, I like, went through everything, but I wanted to be that really good student and show up for the, you know, the aftercare. They asked me to stop coming to aftercare, and I was crushed, you know. But the thing is, is that she's like, there's people here that want to get help, and you're not one of them. And basically your bullshit is not fooling me, and you're no longer welcome here. And and I, like, was like, oh, that was a follow-through consequence. But, and uh, and I guess it was about a month after that. I, it was a Sunday. This was in January of 07. I busted out my front teeth drinking all day. Uh, I was at a party. And um, that was one of those moments where you're like, Oh, now I done really messed myself up. You know what I mean? Like you look in the mirror and you're like, I don't have any teeth. You know? <laughs> you're like, I am a monster. I remember screaming that. Like, I'm a monster. Like, freak it out. <sighs> you know, don't be messing with my beautiful. <sighs> that was so humbling. That was like one of those moments, you know? Because you, you ain't picking up nobody. Who, I mean, you can. I don't. I mean, if, <laughs> If any of you don't, I did get teeth, but um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. So the thing is, is that that still didn't get me sober because it just so happened that I had dental insurance, and it was like, okay, and my mom came and called the dentist for me, and it was like, yes, here's the team, and they're going to help me again, and they did. And I'm very grateful because I'm very grateful for my teeth. But <laughs> the thing is is that I didn't have to deal with it on my own. And uh, the reason for which I say this is this was in January, and I promised, promised, promised I was going to get sober. So from January to September, my family thought I was sober. Everyone thought I was sober in a way. I don't know if they really believed it, but it was better to believe that than to think that their little girl was out there doing what she was doing. And it was, um, at that point, I had started at Paul Mitchell Cosmetology School. I really thought I was going to be able to uh, follow through and finish something. However, in September, around, like, the 19th, I realized that um, that if I wasn't going to get it then, that if I couldn't even get it with something that I had a passion for, uh, like hair and makeup and um, something that I really wanted to do, but yet I was still dying inside to the point um, I went on a um, like a three-day bender, like totally um, immersed myself in hiding out like I always did. But I had money and I had the substances, I had the alcohol. Um, and that um, September, I don't even, it was a Friday night. Um, I had an overdose in a bathroom. I was never taken to the hospital. I was rolled over on my side. And I remember, you know, that uh, dry heaving where you're just like, oh, you know, like I didn't know if I was going to survive. All I know is that I kind of like just, again, back in those damn bathrooms. I swear I should have a phobia of restrooms. But I cracked, like just fell down, and they just rolled me over because they had their children in the house, and they didn't want to have that attention you know, drawed to their home, but I woke up that day, and I was supposed to be at the salon to uh, apprentice, and um, and and I just started the lies, you know. It was just another day of making up the excuses. However, I got in the car, and I plugged in my phone, and I had messages, and my dad called, and, and he said, why are you doing this? And I had no more excuses. I had no more reservations. Um and I was scared, but I had been going to meetings a lot during that, like, year and a half. So I had numbers, and I filed one a wet, like, a slip of the numbers in a filing cabinet in my closet. And I went to work, and um, I didn't drink, and that was a baby miracle. And uh, I pulled out the numbers, and the woman told me to come to the 6.30 a.m. meeting at Winter Park Group. And I was like, ooh, damn, that's early, you know? But it didn't matter because I didn't have anything else to do. You know, I couldn't even um, imagine uh, continuing on, but I was still so terrified because I had tried AA before. And um, But that Sunday, my dad didn't call. My mom told me she was letting me go, uh, that she could no longer watch me die, nor could she help me in the process because that's what my family had been doing. 
And uh, I get chills thinking about it because there was no team to help Lauren. It was Lauren, and it was those damn list of phone numbers. <laughs> and um, and I didn't know it, but it was God. And th- at the time, I uh, got my white chip. About a, I guess it was about four days in, I was laying. I don't even know the time, but all I know is I uh, was so afraid that it wasn't going to work this time. But it wasn't for anybody else anymore. This was like if I wanted it and I had to want to live more than I wanted to die, and that was the case. Thank you, God. And uh, I, I always tell this story. This is my spiritual experience. It happened real quick. Um. I was laying on my bed. I was thinking of how I was going to continue into school. I was thinking of all the things, a mile a minute, and in my head, you know, the, you know, like, damn it, shut up. And I could never shut it up. But I said, okay, God, and I'm, like, laid out. I talk about, like, on the crucifix. I'm, like, laid out on the bed, you know, when you're just, like, oh, the fan's going. You're, like, looking at the fan. It'll slow down, you know. I was, like, oh, if my mind could only slow down like that fan. But uh, I was, like, God, if you, if, like, help me, basically. And I was listening to the soundscapes on the Bright House. I think it's Bright House. And it has that peaceful music, you know. It wasn't that beat down music where I'd be going to the club. It was like this time to meditate music, you know. And uh, I loved Native American spirit flutes. I loved them. My granny brought me up listening to those. And I was like, okay, God, if you were here, I need a sign. And right then, like, the spirit flutes came on. And it was like, it was like one of those moments where I don't know, I don't believe in coincidences, but I was like, God is here. I was like, thank you, God, thank you, God. And my mind, like, stopped for, like, just a moment where I was like, I don't have to think anymore for this moment. If I want to get sober, I can get sober. It's basically the gist that I got to me. You know what I mean? Um, And I wasn't afraid that it wasn't going to work because just like that, something was different. And... uh so September 22nd, 2007 is my sobriety date, and I didn't have to pick up a drink since that time. Um, 6.30 a.m. meeting was too early for this woman, so I ma- made it on down the road to the greenhouse, and that's where I see some of my friends there um, here tonight. Um, it's amazing. Uh, I got a sponsor within two weeks of being sober, and uh, every Friday night there was a big book story our big book study there on every Friday night, man. And my sponsor was doing the study, and afterwards we'd go in this little tiny back room. I was like, well, this room, you know, but that room is where I did my third step prayer. That room is where I walked through the book with another woman. It don't matter where you do this at. It's how you feel while you're doing it. It, it You know, um, I could never imagine that that book, I remember the first, like, around the first week of my sobriety, I was reading the doctor's opinion, and I called my mom. I was like, Mom, why didn't you have me read this before? This is me. And she's like, Girl, you were not ready. And I was like, Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I wasn't. But that, when I read it this time, I got it. I finally realized what the doctor's opinion says. And if you're a newcomer, which I know there's a few in here, Woo! Read the doctor's opinion. You are not alone anymore. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, because that book, I was like, yes, I'm not crazy. Like the little girl who thought I was always crazy, you know. Um, And uh, so what I want to, you know, talk about is that my sponsor spent that time with me on a Friday night. Um, I didn't sponsor women until I had two years sober, and I was like, man, what's wrong? Everybody else is like, how many sponsors do you have? And I'm like. I don't have any sponsees or sponsees, you know. And I was like, is something wrong with my program? God, what's up? You know what I mean? And uh, But there was other service work that I was meant to do at that time. And uh, today I have sponsees. And um, that's something I want to talk about right now. That's one of the most amazing, you know, I always hear people say, oh, wait till you take somebody through the steps. And I can't look over at her right now. Mm. But... Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't have a higher power, 
you just walk, wait, <laughs> and you get the opportunity to walk somebody through the steps, and you start seeing God for real, live in the flesh, coming through. And she'll say things, and I'm like, I'm just so grateful. You know, I'm so grateful that this is how this program works, you know, um, because talk about, you know, contingent upon, you know, um, a daily reprieve. Just being able to get out, not even getting outside of myself, because sometimes that's asking too much, but just showing up to sit down and read this book, the big book. I'm acting like it's right here, but if it was, I'd hold it up. <laughs> to, read, to read the big book, it starts speaking. You know, you don't have, it, like, it's so powerful. When we get together in a room, we are alcoholics who have gotten sober. That takes a lot of energy. So when that amount of energy gets together, you feel it, even if you don't want to feel it. And if you ain't feeling it yet, you just keep coming back. And and to see someone else get it, like I got it. I now see what my sponsor was talking about because I really got it. When I came in, it wasn't like it was happening. I was changing, and now I'm getting to see that in another woman. It's the best thing I can it, my life is full you know um and I have to be reminded of that because I have this disease of alcoholism that likes to trick me you know what I'm saying that likes to say da 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 is what you're not doing right but if I can flip it and you can too I use the gratitude list you know that helps me so much because it's like a moment where that helps me, like that one single ceiling van spinning around. A gratitude list helps me slow down my mind enough to say, God is with me and all is well. Like, truly believe that. Um, I uh, I do service work today. It's very important for me. Um, the greenhouse is no longer my home group. Psychic Change is my home group. I was looking for a traditions meeting, and I found one. Um, and that was another baby miracle. Um, at that point is when we were um, going to bid for the Florida Conference of Young People in AA, uh, and I didn't even know that we had a young people's group in Orlando. I'm like, oh, well, so I was not supposed to know uh, a year sober that we had a young people's group <laughs> for other reasons. And um, so... The thing is, is that today I was able to shift a little bit, and uh, and I can be of service there to new to new people, to new women that are coming in the rooms, and um, it's a great you know place. We have uh, meetings at 10 p.m. So if you ever need a meeting late night, six days a week, Monday through Saturday, and uh, we're ho- Stacy shares about it all the time here. I love you for that, Stacy. She makes those announcements. You know, we have the conference. Um, I'm a part of the conference, co- the host committee. And um, what I want to talk about real quick is that when it talks about the amends, um, I thought I had to make every amends real, like right away. And it was talked, you know, some of them will come in timing. Which, um, I for- you read, I don't remember your name, I apologize, but Rita, you read about going with the flow of God. All right, well, God's got a flow, and it's amazing. And uh, this year, uh, not this year, well, this year, but next week, I'm going to New York, and one of the girls that I wasn't able to follow through with on a friendship, and I, she, we're, like, going to have dinner. You know, I'm going to be able to make an amends. Um, you know, I'm coming up, God willing, on three years sober. So for me, that one, that's one of those ones that's, like, it's timing, you know what I mean? Um, I wasn't ready before. It would have just been spitting out my mouth. It wouldn't have felt nothing. Um, and uh, so everything comes in a timing. And I know that um, I just I just know in my being of everything that uh, that God is way bigger than me today. I thought I was the biggest thing in the world. Do you know what I'm saying? I... Uh, I thought I don't I don't know. I just just mm, I guess just what I'm saying is follow the directions. It'll happen how it's supposed to happen for you and that's why I can only share what it was like for me. Um 
and today I'm able to have relationships. I learned how to have relationships in here when I didn't want to show up, and I showed up anyways. I started becoming accountable um, where it might have been vacuuming the floor or chairing a meeting or just saying hello to someone. That for me today is God working through me. If I can continue there on a daily basis, to me, that's what's, it, that's what's up when it talks about, you know, um, contingent upon my daily reprieve is allowing for the openness to stay open and the willingness, you know, so that God can work through me. Because I gave myself up when I said my third step prayer, you know. Um, and when I, when I share with you all tonight... You know, it could get real freaked out, that little recorder thing, but it ain't about me. And I ask God to speak through me and use me as a vessel. And I talk about God a lot because that's what's up for me. That's what it is. For my recovery, I have to remember that. And we have these, you know, these steps. You know, they call them some simple rules. And um, just get with somebody else. They'll teach you how to do them. It's not, it just is what it is. Don't overthink it. Just go with the flow. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.